Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to have to bring the rest of the message began this morning. This morning we titled the message, The Wrath of Almighty God. And really we talked about uh, a lot of things. You'll notice where you get that thought there in verse 7 where it said, I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty. Now, the Bible uses that word Almighty to describe God. What I preached on this morning was the wrath of Almighty God. That means He has all might, all mighty. Now tonight, we'll title the message. It's the second part of the message, but I want to title the message tonight, No Place to Hide. No Place to Hide. God's letting people get by with a lot nowadays. The day's going to come when the Lord begins to pour out His wrath on this earth. There will be no place to hide. Back over in, I believe, chapter 6 and 7 along in there, the Bible said they'll run to the rocks and mountains and beg the rocks and mountains to fall on them and cover them from the face of God, but there'll be no place for them to hide. Now, let me say this tonight. This is a great truth. You be sure you get it. Young people, be sure you get this. You listening? You cannot hide from God. You can't do it. You cannot hide from God. God sees you. Midnight and midday are the same to God. You can't hide from Him. He knows everything you do even before you do it. You cannot get away from Him. God knows more about you than your mother or your daddy. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. Anybody in here know how many hired... Well, some of you guys, it wouldn't be... But you normal people, would anybody in here know how many hairs is on your head? Anybody? Anybody in here know how many hairs on your head? Could you tell me within 5,000, one way or the other? Anybody? Well, you don't know much, near as much about yourself as God knows. Because the Lord knows exactly. He subtracts two or three hundred from you women every, every morning. Really? And puts it down there? Well, she lost 486 this morning. She put them curler, a curling iron in it and jerked out three or 400. And, and then she didn't got mad and jerked the brush through it and said, it looks awful. I'm going to go have me a temporary. I'm going to go do something. Well, the Lord never up. He knows exactly how many you've got in your head right now. So you cannot hide from God. Now, I talked about this morning that the Lord had seven angels. And each one of these seven angels got a bow. It's, it's like a bowl. And this bowl's got wrath in it. And when they pour out their wrath, then it starts, all the bad stuff starts happening in what we call the Great Tribulation. The book of Revelation is in three parts. If you don't understand those three parts, you're going to get messed up in it. First part is chapter 1, 2, and 3. Second part is chapter 4, verse 1, to chapter 19, verse 11. That's in that period's where we are tonight. Third part is from chapter 19, verse 11, to the end of the book. The first part is things which uh, were, church age. Second part, the things which are. John transferred up to the day of the Lord, looking down on the day of the Lord and the wrath of God. There's the things that are. Second part. Third part is the things which shall be hereafter. And you leave your daddy alone, son. All right? Listen. And the Bible said here that there are seven angels having seven vows. Now, I want to bring you this evening the message from beginning with the third angel and on through to the end. Now, I'm personally of the opinion, and I believe tonight, that the book of Revelation, especially from four 1 to 1911, is not chronological. That means those events in there don't, don't take place one right after another. They overlap. You say, where do you get that? I'll give you one little example. Keep your Bible open there. 
and verse number, look at chapter 14 and verse number 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress. Even a... Help me now, mamas. Help me. It needs to be quieter in here. Trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. He said blood came out of the horse's bridle. That is a picture of what? The battle of Armageddon, right? Now, it took place there in chapter 14, if you're going to take it all chronologically. But look in chapter 16 and verse 12. The way of the kings of the east are prepared. And verse number 16, And he gathered them into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. It's taken place again. You say, Brother Danny, how come when you're reading Revelation, it'll say over here there were thunderings and everything blew up and this happened and the time of the dead has come and thy wrath has come way back in chapter 6 and then here you go and again and a few chapters later and do it again and here you go in chapter 20 and have great small dead stand before God. Brother Danny, I get confused in that book. It seemed like it said the same thing over and over. You're exactly right. Have you ever read Matthew? And then turn right around and read the same thing in Mark. And then turn right around and seen the same story in, in Luke. And then the same story in John. How many times did he feed the 5,000? Once. How many times did he feed the 4,000? Once. But there's two or three accounts of that same story. The first coming of Christ is in four parts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they overlap each other. The second coming of Christ is part, and it takes you four straight trips through the tribulation in the book of Revelation. And that's typified by the Pharaoh's dream back in Genesis, where he dreamed that those seven uh, weak ears, those seven strong ears of corn, and there were seven here and seven there, and then there were seven uh, fat cows and seven skinny cows, and all of that represented two seven-year periods. Four pictures of actually two seven-year periods. Now, that's what you get here in the book of Revelation. So, now we're in the tribulation period. Me and you, during this time, are going to be up on God's ironing board, getting the wrinkles and spots ironed out at the judgment seat of Christ so we can put on our wedding garment and our, and our big, long, flowing evening wedding gown won't have any wrinkles in it when we march down the aisle to marry the Lord Jesus Christ. While the wrath of God's being poured out down here, you and I will be up there at the judgment seat of Christ. So, to be honest with you, I'm glad I ain't going through the wrath of God, but me and you ain't going to be in no shouting time, especially if we don't get on the ball. And brother, I'm telling you tonight, there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be some bloody hands, there's going to be some broken hearts, and there's going to be some burned works for us at the judgment seat of Christ. That judgment doesn't determine if you're saved or not. That was fixed up when you knelt at the cross and got born again. That judgment is going to get the wrinkles out of your garment. But here we are in the tribulation, the most terrible time that the world has ever seen. I know what's probably running through some of his mind. I'm going to have to hurry or I'm never going to get to these angels. But I know what's running through some of his mind. And I've had people ask me over and over and over since I've been preaching, Brother Danny, do you believe people can be saved in the tribulation? Now, that sounds like a good question, but that is about as dumb a question, really, as you can ask if you read your Bible. See? Now, if you just listen to preachers all the time, I can see how that sounds smart. But if you read your Bible, that's a dumb question. Turn to chapter 7. Look back in chapter 7. Now, you'd be surprised how many of these questions get cleared up if you just hush and read. Amen? That's right. Look at Revelation chapter number 7. I've heard people say that only Jews could be saved in the tribulation. Now, that's a dumb, stupid thing to say. You say, how come? I'll read it to you in plain English. Revelation chapter number 7. And look here at verse uh, number... Let's see here. Verse number 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 
of all the Jehovah Witnesses of the United States and Canada. No. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel, there are your Jews. Out of all the tw tribes, 12,000. They're saved. Everybody agrees with that, right? Now, look at verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, watch it now, of all nations, not just Jews, all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and to our God, uh, and unto the Lamb. Now, hold your place there, I say. 144,000 Jews, and then there's a great big mob of people from all kinds of nations, and all kinds of tribes, and all kinds of tongues. Who are they? Verse number 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are those that are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. You see why I said that's a dumb question? And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, it's a dumb question to ask, can people be saved in the tribulation? Of course they can. The Bible said there's a great number of multitude of all peoples and tongues, not to mention the Jews. They'll be saved during the great tribulation. Now the question comes up, what about old Joe down here that we've been a witnessing to for 20 years? What's going to become of him? If old Joe has heard a clear presentation of the gospel and the Holy Ghost of God has dealt with his heart and he deliberately rejected the truth, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 said that God will send him strong delusion that he should believe a lie because he received not the truth and the love of truth that he might be saved. God will let him believe a lie and be damned. So God's got it fixed up where it's all fair to everybody and nobody's getting cheated and nobody can say, I didn't know. God's got it fixed up, brother. I'll guarantee you that. So there's going to be a lot happening during the Great Tribulation. But I'll tell you one thing, you don't want to wait a lap time. I've heard people say, well, I'll just wait a lap time and I'll get saved and I'll get my head cut off. And I'll... Ah, fooey too. If you won't get saved and live for God as easy as it is now, you ain't going to get saved, brother, when it means getting your head cut off. If you're too chicken to get saved now, just because somebody might laugh at you, you ain't going to stand on the chopping block, brother, and let them take an axe down on your neck. I'm telling you, there ain't many Americans would do that at any price. I guarantee you that for sure. Well, we here talked about this morning that the first angel came out and poured upon the earth. The second angel came out and poured out his vial upon the sea. Now let's look at verse number 4. Excuse me, verse number 4. The Bible said that in verse number 4. Here comes the Lord getting ready to wipe out the earth. Now, we'll not read that just yet. Look over yonder at verse number 19. And at the bottom of verse 19, the Bible said, Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. The Bible describes the wrath of God as being fierceness. The Bible describes the Lord Jesus Christ as a lion. And He's going to come out as a roaring lion. The month of March that we're in right now comes in like a lamb and goes out like a lion. First time the Lord comes, He comes as a lamb. The second time He comes, He'll come as a lion. Turn back, hold your place there and turn back to Psalm 50. There's a verse of Scripture there in Psalm 50 that always kind of scary to me when I read it. And I want to read it to you right quickly. Psalm 50. And then we're going to look at a verse in Psalm 7. Psalm 50. Just a quick Bible study. And then we'll talk about these angels. Psalm 50 and verse 22. Here's what God's saying to the world right now. 
He's going to come and get them like a mad lion. Psalm 50 and verse 22. Now consider this. Ye that forget God, here comes a line, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. You'll not hear that modernistic crowd of most TV preachers preach on that verse. You won't hear all those preachers get on TV and say, God's going to tear you in pieces. No! That's bad for finances, man. That's bad for your, that's bad for your, your, your program. I mean, you ain't going to hear, you ain't going to see a, a lot of charismatic magazines coming out and the headlines is going to say, guess what? God's going to tire you in pieces if you don't quit forgetting it. There's a lot of the Bible. You know, I'm, I'm persuaded to believe a lot of people just use the Bible to make a living off of. And there's parts of it that'll make a, help them make a good living. They like, and the part that will hurt their income, they just ignore it. And I'm telling you, friend, if we don't take it all, we better not take none of it. Amen? And this book said God's a God that's going to tear a bunch of people into pieces one of these days. And you know what that means in the Hebrew? That means He's going to tear them into shreds. That means in pieces. It means just what it says and said just what it meant. If God meant something else, He'd have said something else. I want to look at Psalm 7. Psalm 7. And in Psalm 7, there's another verse there, and look at verse number 12. Psalm 7 and verse 12. Well, let's go ahead and get verse 11 right quick. In Psalm 7, verse 11. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Don't tell me God's looking up there smiling at people in Hollywood. He ain't done it. He is angry every day. Verse 12, If he turn not, he will whet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. So, the way I take that is back at Calvary, God said, all right, mankind, go. Man started sinning. Man started sinning. Man started sinning. God pulled out an arrow called judgment, wrath. He put it in his bow. Man kept sinning. God pulled it back. Man kept sinning. God pulled it back. 1000 A.D., 1500 A.D., 1600, 1700, 1800, 1900, 1980. Oh, boy. 1986, he sees all the adultery, all the drinking, all the cursing, all the dopers, all, all the heads, all, all the pushers. And he's pulling that thing back, pulling that thing back. He's getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And right here in this Scripture tonight, in Revelation 16, he lets go. And brother, I wouldn't want to be around when God let go of that arrow. I wouldn't want to be around when God lets go of that. There'll be no place to hide. If you're here tonight and you're not right with the Lord, one of these days God's arrow's going to come flying. There ain't going to be no place to hide for you. So look here in chapter 16 and verse 4. And we see the third vial. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. It didn't say like blood. It said blood. It didn't say the color of blood. It said blood. It didn't say they became as blood. It said blood. There might have been a little doubt about what he said there in that verse ahead of that about the sea, but there's no doubt about this one. This one clears it up. They became blood. They became blood. Now, this morning I talked about the second angel. The second angel poured out his vial on the sea. Third angel poured out his vial on the streams and rivers. Now, in the ocean there's salt water. Have, have you ever drunk any salt water? Anybody in here? I've drunk some, not on purpose. Man, I've been down there at the, at the ocean or at the beach or swimming, boy, and about that time here come a big wave, and I'd want to tell somebody something over there, and I'd say, Ha! 
I'm boy, I, I saw it all around me. Right down, and it, you swallow it before you even have time to spit it out. And it feels like somebody has mixed about three teaspoons of salt in about that much water and right down your throat. Lord, it's, it's awful. It's so salty you can't hardly stand it. When you dry out, man, your fingers stick together. And it's in your toes. It's in your high. It, it's all over the place. Just nothing but salt. But you can't, you can't do much with that water as far as drinking. If you go back up in the mountains here, you got a little stream coming out. Man, you can take it. It's just like this right here. And boy, that just tastes so good. You can't, there ain't no salt in it. That is, is what we call fresh water. Now this morning when the second angel come out there and poured out his vial, the sea uh, became as the blood of a dead man. That means that all the living soul, all the fish, all the turtles, all the shark, all the shrimp, all the oysters died in the water. What a terrible time that would be. But when this next angel comes out, it gets worse. For he pours out his vial up on the stream. And those little mountain streams start bubbling up and they just start turning red. Can you imagine it running down through there, getting red and just turning into solid blood? And boy, that will happen just instantaneously like it did back in the book of Exodus. If you want to find out what God's going to do in the tribulation, go back and read the first 15 chapters of Exodus. And brother, you see what Moses did to Egypt and God Almighty will someday do to the world what he done to Egypt back in the book of Exodus. Egypt is a type of the world, a picture of the world, and that was a type. As a matter of fact, Moses is going to be around during this time, believe it or not. And brother, he'll be there. It said he'll have power to turn the waters to blood in Revelation chapter 11. And my dear friend, he put that water to blood. That water's going to come running down through there. I can imagine the millions of American households. Now you listen to me tonight. You listen very carefully. This is going to sound hard to believe. Some of you ain't going to get this if you don't listen real carefully. There'll be people get up in the United States of America one more and brother, they'll go in the the shower and they'll turn that shower water on and they'll go over here and say, hmm, give them out a towel and lay it over here and brother, lay a washcloth down and open up that shower door or pull back that shower curtain and there'll be screams and hollers and it's nothing but red blood coming out in their shower. And brother, some of them will get up and put on a pot of oatmeal or boil an egg or some coffee and boy, turn to speak it on like that. And brother, that, that, by that time, blood will be in that well down yonder where God Almighty's right. Turn the water into blood. And brother, it'll come out of there. Some of y'all look at me like you don't believe this. You believe the Bible, don't you? Brother, is the Bible a lie? If that Bible's the truth, the water in Maine's going to turn to blood one of these days. I said the water up at City Hall, the water in Nebo and Glenwood will someday be blood. It's hard to believe, ain't it? We say we believe the Bible. What's wrong with us? It's going to happen. Man, can you imagine that water running pretty clean there for a while because it's in the pipes and stuff, you know, and it starts getting pink and darker and darker. Y'all ever tasted blood? I ain't a cannibal, man. I ain't no Satan church or nothing like that, but playing ball, I've tasted blood and sweat mixed together. You know, somebody believe on blood <laughs> right in your mouth, something like that, boy. And have you ever got cut and went, Ooh, and sucked it till it quit hurting and kind of tasted the blood? It don't taste too good. And I can imagine people will be screaming, they'll be hollering, TV, CBS, NBC, ABC, newspapers flashing off. Strangest thing, what is happening? The world's gone crazy. Words that big on the front pages of newspapers, and people will be madly rushing down to the grocery store to buy those jugs of water, you know, and fresh water supplies in tanks and stuff. They'll be fighting over it. I tell you, friend, you, you've never saw what a man will do. You've never saw what a civilization, a civilization will do when they run out of water, son. When a man, when a country runs out of water, anything, they'll kill you. They'll, they'll stomp over you. They'll run over you for a drop of water. That's why I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. 
You say, Brother Danny, why is God going to do that? Look at verse 5. I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord. Just in case anybody got the idea the Lord was doing wrong. In case anybody said that's too harsh. In case anybody said that's not fair. In case anybody said he don't have the right. Daniel said, Thou art righteous, O Lord. Amen, brother. One of these days, we may not can see it now, but when that day comes, we'll say the same thing. Amen, God. Amen, God. Amen, God. You know why? Because He said, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and lost and shalt be, because Thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and Thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are Thy judgments. I tell you, the glorious host of heaven will be up there, and they won't be saying, Oh, Lord, please don't do it to them. They're nice people. Really, Lord, they're a little bit immoral, and they drink a little bit, and they cuss and they lay out of church, but I mean, but Lord, please, not this. No, sir, brother, there's no pity then. The wrath of God comes. Pity's now. Mercy's now. There ain't going to be no pity then. Well, brother, they'll stand up there and they'll say, Amen, God, give it to them, Lord. Let it rip. They've been preached to for years. They've been tried to, they've been pled with. They've been fasted for. My preachers tried to get them to get saved, and they cussed them and throwed rocks at them, and busted their brains out and sawn them asunder and tormented them and put them in caves and rocks and dens. They liked it to a word. They liked it to a church. They made fun of the preachers. They tried to get Christians fired. Give them blood for breakfast. And he's going to do it. Verse 8. You know something about the wrath of God? Once it starts, there's no stopping it. It's just bang, bang, bang. Son, when one of them starts, the others are right behind. Now I can imagine people saying, No, God! No, God! No, God! No, God, please! No, God! No, God! God don't even pay no attention to it. When them angels takes off, as soon as one of them pours out his vial, he say, "Go!" People are screaming, "Go! Go!" Buddy, there's no stopping. There's no stopping. When God gets mad, there's no stopping. When the fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, that's it. When the flood came up, that was it. God will give you a certain. You listening? God will give you a certain amount of time to get right and be just good to you as He can be. But you go so far, and that's it. That's it! You're cut off! You ain't got no more chances! Here He comes here in verse 4, or verse 8, and the fourth angel come. Uh-oh, look what He does. He poured out His vial upon the sun. Now what the first one poured out on? Earth. What the second one poured out on? See. What a third one poured out on? Rivers and streams. What a fourth one poured out on? Sun. You realize this evening that the God that me and you are serving is the God that controls the sun? Have you looked at the sun lately? I ain't. It's up by those sun. I mean, it is there in all of its glory. And that is a whopper too, man. 93 million miles from here and you can't even look at it. And the Lord says, go. And this fourth angel comes out and he can get close to the sun. He gets over the thermostat and turns it up. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched. That's a, that's a word, isn't it? I remember when I was a little, Mom would say, well, I was, I was fixing this and that, and I went off and I forgot it, and I scorched it. 
You used to scorch. What did you scorch? Huh? What? Beans. Yeah, I scorched the beans. I scorched the oatmeal. Making homemade candy, I scorched the chocolate. When something scorched, man, it just burned. Now, the Lord's going to say, all right, hit it, fourth angel. Fourth angel comes flying out, up goes the heat. Man, boy, people get up one morning, it's about nine o'clock and say, man, it's going to be a hot day. What's the newspaper say? Partly cloudy over most of the northwest today and the southeast. With a high in the mid-90s, we expect it to be very warm. And it gets 90. By dinner time, it's 95. By 1 o'clock, it's 120. <laughs> Get you a suntan then, man. In the house. With the curtains closed. Brother, in the bed sleep. 125 by 2 that evening. 140. In the shade. 150. 160. I'll just get me some cool water. Oh, yeah. You remember what the water is, don't you? Oh, Brother Danny, God wouldn't really do that. Yeah, he's going to do it. Man, people, some people got to work. They'll be outside in that scorching heat. Boy, they'll be, they'll be doing like Grandma and him used to, build them big old hat on, like a big umbrella. They'll be passing out like flies. They'll be having heat strokes. People will be saying, what has gone wrong? People will be saying, it's a crazy space program. They shot all them rockets up there and messed up the atmosphere now we're all going to burn up and people, there'll be fighting going on. There'll be killing going on. Remember, the restraint is gone. The Holy Ghost is gone. The Lord will still work and save people on the spot in different places. But the Holy Ghost dwelling inside the believer as the body of Christ is gone. It's a rapture. All hell's going to break loose. It's going to be a nightmare, a horror movie. That's great heat. Scorches men. You say, well, Brother Danny, they'll get right by the millions, won't they? No. Verse 9, And men were scorched with great heat. They didn't get right. They blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give Him glory. I tell you, they'd stick their fist up in the face of God and cuss Him and say, God, it's your fault we're in this mess. It's your fault. And brother, they'd curse Almighty God. They didn't get right. They just cursed. God says, all right, go. Here comes the fifth. Verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. Now that's where the beast throne is. That's where the Antichrist rules from. And his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of the pain and their sores and repented not of their deed. No place to hide. The kingdom of the beast gets dark. And brother, they begin to chew their tongues. It gets so dark you can't see your hand in front of you. It gets so dark you can't see anything. It's darkness like in the book of e in Exodus in Egypt when they said it was thick. And brother, you could just, it was, could be felt. Bible said that darkness back in the book of Exodus that you could feel it. It was so dark you could feel it. And it gets so dark, man, it just, the air is just thick. 
And that only happens in the dwelling of the kingdom of the beast. And boy, they have a big blackout like New York City or some place like that. And all the power goes off and darkness settles in. And God Almighty begins to judge them. And people are already drinking blood, burning up, sores all over their body, and starving and, and wanting water. And they begin to chew their tongues and bite their tongues and swallow them and curse them. God. You ever seen anybody chew their tongue? I mean, you're hurting so bad you chew your tongue. Verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the Now down here in Megiddo, that's where the Armageddo, Megiddo comes from, the valley of Megiddo, there's going to be the valley, uh, the battle fought there, where the blood runs up the horses' bridle. Now to set this thing up, this sixth angel comes out, and he pours out his vial on the river Euphrates, and dries the water up, which has either turned back to water by this time, or else there's still blood. I don't know, but anyway, the river is dried up. Now when that happens, that prepares the way for those kings to march down through that. I don't understand why they'll be riding horses. I have heard in recent years that I believe it's, is it Russia or one of the countries over there are training horses literally by the thousands and soldiers to ride those things. Because a horse can't be picked up by a lot of the radar and detecting you don't know where the armies are at. Then there's other things, maybe fly over a helicopter, something that could find. I don't know. Somehow or another, they're going to come down through there. Was it say how many of them was it? Somewhere two hundred thousand, thousand or something like that. Maybe that's in the other scripture over there. And God begins to bring them down through there. And they had the horse. Where, where did, you find, did somebody find it? Where's it at? It tells how many they are. It's two hundred thousand thousand. If I ain't mistaken. Nine sixteen. Thank you. Voices come up here and tell me things. When I need to know them like it. All right, chapter number nine, and look at verse number fourteen. Here's another way you know the book of Revelation ain't chronological. Here's the whole thing happening again back in chapter 9. And verse 14, loose the four angels. That ain't the Beatles. That's what Charles Manson thought it was. Which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels which were loosed were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand. There they are. Now, as these armies come down and they begin to march, they're preparing themselves for the battle of Armageddon. Now, verse number 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Working miracles. No, note that. Working miracles. Let me tell you something, friend. Everything that works a miracle in these last days is not the power of God. Here's where the Bible said devils will work miracles. I've heard people say, oh boy, that guy down there, he healed somebody. A great miracle happened and I seen this vision and I saw this and that happened. That don't mean one thing. That don't mean God's in it. That don't mean God's within a million miles of it. Here in the tribulation, there are going to be spirits of devils, and they'll be working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now the Lord inserts a little something here in verse 15, just to warn people, Behold, I come as a thief. 
Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Gathered them together. Does that ring a bell? Does that sound like over yonder in the book of Matthew when he said, Gather the tares in bundles together to burn them? Does that sound like what they're doing over in all the religious world, the ecumenical movement saying, We all got to get together? The world saying now, get together. Get all the churches together. Get all the churches together. Break one big religion. God said, come out from among them and be your separate. But they're getting together. And boy, when that happens, they get ready for the battle of Armageddon. I picture it like everything starts happening at once. Blood are running down through there. Shots being fired. Tanks. Man, the Lord's getting ready to come back on that stallion. Boy, here he comes down out of the clouds. But right before he does, something happens. Look at verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. Well, I believe the Lord's about got it all, ain't he? He got the earth. He got the sea, he got the streams, he got the sun, he got the way of the kings of the east, he got the the uh, seat of the Antichrist, and now he gets the air. And look what happened. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunder and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon, you'll find that in the next chapter, we won't have time to go and do right now, came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now this earthquake's going to be so great that look what it does in verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Hold your place, sir, and we'll get that last verse. Here's the world, Rocky Mountains, Indies, Swiss, Alps, Blue Ridge. God's going to go... Boom! And when he shakes the earth, it's going to shake it so hard, it's just going to make a round ball out of it. Now, buddy, that's an earthquake. Buildings in New York just going to crumble. It'll completely be out of hand now. It's completely gone wild now. Television communications, except for some satellite. Radio communication will virtually be wiped out. And the population gone mad runs from the wrath of Almighty God. Boy, there'll be people screaming. Some will be trying to pray. Some will be shaking their fists. People will be breaking in windows saying, Woo, let's get the diamonds. Let's get the rubies. This will all be over with and we'll have all the money and everything. Man, buildings are falling, people running, screaming, people with their head cut off, people laying over here screaming and hollering, blood all over the place. Boy, you talk about a nightmare this old world headed for one. So, child, don't you let it bother you kids when they make fun of y'all at school because you're a Christian. You feel sorry for them people. They need somebody to pray for them. Man, don't, man they don't need to make fun of us. Lord, we got it made! The last thing that happens in verse 21, it comes a hailstorm. Except this is a hailstorm like ain't never been before. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, 
every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Hailstones that weigh right around a hundred pounds. Can anybody tell me how big a hundred pound ice ball would have to be? This big? This big? A ball of ice that big. Falling out of the sky. Boy. I mean, Alfred Hitch Hitchcock was tuned in, buddy. The only thing is, he's tuned into the wrong world. And they start falling out of the sky, and it fell on people. You talk about a racket. I heard a preacher say one time that he's in a, he and some boys was in service and he's in the war, and they was in the theater watching a movie. And he said, and all, said all of a sudden they heard this big loud roar, and they thought that tanks were coming and the, and the, the enemy was coming and going to shoot them. And they run out of the theater, scared everything, and it was a hailstorm. Big hail balls beating on that top of that theater. You think what's going to happen when they start falling that big around? What would that do to a car? Falling out of the sky and hit it wide, it would smash it to the ground. There wouldn't be nothing left to you but a greasy spot when them things come down on you. I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, I heard you could drop like a penny or a nickel off the Empire State Building or something like that. It'd hit and stick up in the cement. That's hard to believe. I don't know about that. But I, I, I wouldn't want to hit me in the head, would you? Oh, a penny down in your head. But that would hurt. And you think about a big solid ball, man. Man, you never know what hit you. You know, when it come that little last year when the tent was up and it dented in people's hoods of their cars and busted glass and everything? Just a little taste. Lord, just salt him a little bit of that. You wait till he dumps the gravel out. And men cuss. And God begins to wind it up. The Lord comes back out of there and begins to smash his enemies between his toes. Blood runs up there that deep for a long way. And the army's in heaven. That's us coming back. Rule and reign with him. There'll be no place to hide. No place to hide, teenagers. No place to hide, Mom. I'll get my fallout shelter. What you gonna do when a mountain's level? Shake that thing right out of the ground. No place to hide. I believe it was my shoe or something. I had one time. I think it was a shoe. Let's just say it was a shoe. And there was an ant on it. I think it was an ant. I had something one time that had something on it. I ain't sure. But I thought it was my shoe with an ain't on it. And this ain't, it was something, and it, it seen me. And I can imagine, what if it, it, it was about that big, and it looked around there and seen me? What if, what if you was walking across here and looked up and saw a big face, big as this building? And he, looked, and he just started just to get me. He really thought he was going to get away from me. Really. He went, ah! And just started going like this. And I just held that shoe there and said, You fool. You ain't going. What do you think you're going? I just let him crawl around there and let him crawl around there. And then like, boom. And that's about like a man trying to get away from God, brother.
God looks at the world like it's up there. He looks around there and sees people. Well, I'll run over here. I'll go join the army. He won't find me. I'll go do this. I'll do that. God don't know. And the Lord's on there and says, You fool, you. You can run and run and run and run. One day he's going to go. You can't get away from him. You're wasting your time. He'll be there waiting on you. No, have to move. No place. Never head bowed, never eye closed. Never head bowed, every eye closed. While they come get us a song tonight, maybe somebody here would say, Brother Danny, it scares me tonight when you start talking about the wrath of God. I'm not saved. I'm not saved. But I want to be saved tonight. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I don't want to go through that terrible time.